Hi folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on Fat Burning Man, where we talk about real food and real results. Today we have a special throwback show with Matt Lalonde, PhD, also known as The Kraken. You're going to learn what people do wrong when going paleo, why nutrient density matters, and what you should eat for dinner. Before we get to the show, here's the review of the week. This one is from Kevin, and he says, Hey, Abel, I've been listening to your show for the past year or two, and I've lost over 80 pounds from some of the advice I've received from your show. Keep doing what you do. Thanks, Kevin. Kevin, love hearing that you're down 80 pounds. Congrats, man. So if you have your own success story that you'd like to share, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or drop me a line anytime at fatburningman.com. Now, did you know that over 80% of your fat loss results come from what you eat, not how much you exercise. In fact, I dropped 20 pounds in just over a month by exercising just a few minutes a week and making very specific tweaks to my diet and focusing on real food. Here's a hint, and you're going to learn about it in this show, nutrient density. One of the most surprising reasons people fail to get results is because they're short on time and don't know what to cook for dinner. So they settle for junky convenience foods that sacrifice their progress. Has that ever happened to you? It's definitely happened to me. But the truth is this, you can lose fat permanently without drugs, supplements, or crazy workouts. Whether you need to lose 100 pounds or that stubborn last 10, you can start your transformation today without gimmicks, just real delicious foods from your local supermarket. And we'd like to show you how. We spent a year gathering the best paleo grain-free real food recipes from the top chefs on the net, and it's finally ready for you. It's called The Fat Burning Chef, and I know you're going to love it. The Fat Burning Chef is an e-cookbook with over 200 quick and easy recipes that will help you lose fat, avoid disease, and experience superhuman energy. Blueberry cheesecake, smoked pork shoulder drizzled in homemade barbecue sauce, and much more are waiting for you inside. You can make these quick and easy meals in 20 minutes or less. These recipes are gluten-free, paleo, 100% real food, and no counting needed. And thousands of people all across the world are enjoying the recipes right now. Vicky says the bacon-wrapped meatballs were delicious, baked on a bed of cabbage. The whole family loved them. Laura says, just made Fat Burning Man's BLT salad, and I think I'm in love. Elizabeth says, my four-year-old and I had fun making the zucchini meat boats for the sweet potato medallions. Very good. But it's not just about the recipes. We sincerely want to change the world with real food. So when you buy The Fat Burning Chef, you get a free copy to give as a gift to share with family or friends. Help us spread this message of health and share it with the people you care about completely for free. And when you get Fat Burning Chef soon, you'll even get our Wild Holiday Feasts cookbook for free. All you have to do to get your discount and bonuses is go to fatburningchef.com. Once again, just type it in on iPhone, Android, tablet, computer, whatever. It'll pop right up. It's fatburningchef.com, and you can get our Wild Feasts ebook for free. All right, on to the show. This one is content-packed, so listen up. Matt Lalonde, PhD, is a lecturer at Harvard University who specializes in chemical biology but studies human metabolism, nutritional biochemistry, health, and athletic performance for fun. In today's show, Matt and I cover how the sausage is made to create Matt's nutrient density framework, how Matt earned the epic and fitting nickname, the Kraken, the most invalid arguments made by paleo folk, and tons more. All right, let's go hang out with Matt. All right, folks, Matt Lalonde, the Kraken, is a chemist at Harvard University with a focus on human metabolism, nutritional biochemistry, health, and athletic performance. He's also one of the most unreasonable men in paleo. What's cooking, Matt? Eh, not much. Unreasonable. I like that. <laughs> I like that uh, too. Yeah, you know my uh, my core training as a scientist just forces me to question everything, and uh, I just wind up pissing off a lot of people. So, <laughs> unreasonable. <laughs> unreasonable sounds pretty good to me. It's so funny, and I, sometimes I go into paleo hacks, and it's always like Matt Lalonde versus someone, <laughs> just like which your is, line of thinking versus someone else. It's so interesting. Which is weird because. 
I actually don't participate in social media a whole lot. So I'm yeah. like, who am I? Who am I again? So I mean, I call out just about everybody in my <laughs> seminar. I do give a seminar. Uh, who is incorrectly using scientific data or manipulating scientific data mm -hmm. or creating um, trials to prove their point as opposed to answer a question, uh, which should actually be done. Uh, I'll call out those people, but yeah. I'm uh, I'm not selective. You know, I, it doesn't matter to me if you're paleo, vegetarian, low carb, high carb. If you did something wrong and I disagree with you, I'll call you out on it. Right. And yeah. so... I, that that begs the question also uh, i've asked around a little bit how did you get the nickname the kraken i'm not sure if it's taboo or not <laughs> <laughs> no, that that comes from rob wolf uh we are in an email exchange with a, a few folks we send out papers ask questions stuff like that and uh sometimes i can you know i'm, I'm pretty busy and i can get fairly impatient and like someone will ask a question that has already been asked before or I've already sent out all the literature on it and whenever that would happen I would just like hit them with like a buttload of science <laughs> like here I gave this to you last week damn it just read it <laughs> and uh, they, they would compare that to like the Kraken crushing a city with its tentacles you know just like here that. you go and you embraced the Kraken uh, th I, mean, I can't get away from it actually uh... <laughs> it's pretty awesome I, I think it's a great nickname and it suits you <laughs> So can we do this? Can you uh, explain, just generally speaking, what the difference is between good science and bad science? So in the, in the realm of science, we study the scientific method, which is, and anyone can go to like Wikipedia or something like that and look it up. There's about 10 steps to it, but it's how you set up your experiment uh, in order to make sure that you are not letting your own personal biases get in the way. So how you set up the experiment, how you gather the data, how you analyze that data, the conclusions that you reach based on that data, <clears throat> all of those things are going to determine whether or not you're doing good science or bad science. Mm -hmm. And if you are a scientist who is not interested in finding the right answer, but interested in being right, yeah. there's a lot of people out there that are just interested in being right. You can manipulate the system at any one of those points, or all of them if you wish, and create something that will give you the answer that you're looking for. Yeah. And you can publish that. Unfortunately, even though there's peer review in the system, you can publish that. There are ways to get really bad science published. There's also ways to get really bad science retracted. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that, that to me is what constitutes uh, bad science, is really someone who is biased, obviously mm -hmm. biased, and is uh, looking for something that will support their vision yeah. and not necessarily looking for the truth or letting the data speak for itself. They're right. just manipulating things because they want a, a particular outcome. And it, that's not your job as a scientist. In fact, right. uh, I'm, I was trained as a chemist. I have a PhD in organic chemistry from Harvard University, so I'm not a nutritionist. This is kind of like a hobby. Mm -hmm. I've been applying the rigor of a core science to nutrition, and I don't call nutrition a core science, unfortunately, not the way that it's conducted right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, you know that that's my background, and I can fairly easily see I have no dog in the fight, right? I've got no right. bias. I don't care who wins or loses. I have no book that's written. It doesn't matter to me. So it's pretty easy for me to see who's who's biased and who's not biased. And I have found biased people everywhere. The, the world of nutrition probably has some of the worst research, maybe next to the world of athletics hmm. uh, that I have ever seen. Exercise physiology has some really, really bad research, but there it's much less of a bias and it is more of a poorly conducted experiments, just the, the very poorly designed experiments yeah. is the, yeah. the proper word. In nutrition, you are you really at, the, at a point where politics and money have more influence than science does right. when it comes to nutrition. And that, that leads to some fairly frustrating situations where the public is not being told the correct information. It's difficult to find the correct information. Mm -hmm. It is easy to find any paper and any piece of research that will support whatever bias you have. If you search for in the literature long enough, you'll find it. Uh, so one really needs a, a pretty good sense of how to analyze this uh, this data, this research, to determine whether it's 
it's legitimate or not. And it's, it's yeah. a difficult task. You, you can't just find a paper and say, look, I'm right. I just found a paper to support my claim. You absolutely can't do that. Right. Yeah. I and mean, when most people, especially if they don't have any sort of background in science, when they hear a scientific study says, they're just That's like, right. it's ironclad. There's no questioning it. I remember when I ran a couple of studies when I was back in school and I was like, as we analyzed it, I was shocked by how many different things and sometimes completely incompatible things we could say based on the data that was there. That's there was correct. like so much, uh, a ridiculous amount of license in what you can do with that data and what you can kind of massage it to say. There's many ways that you can interpret it, yeah. And and you, it's up to, to us to let the public know of all the different options as opposed to saying it's just this, yeah. you know the secret to this is that as soon as you see stuff like that you probably know that you know someone's a, a shaman and <laughs> a false prophet what's you know what should be said though and i mean we have to cut the, the nutrition folks a break is that you're dealing with human beings who are are multivariate who live in a in an environment that is complex and multivariate in itself so some sure. of these studies are very difficult to perform and that's why observational epidemiology is so common in nutrition, mm -hmm. even though it cannot lead to cause and effect, you can't really reach any conclusions from it. You can only make hypotheses. Most of the public does not know that. Yeah. So as we just discussed earlier, you see in the press, you know, this causes that or, or, or whatever statement regarding health. Most of the time, that's probably the result of an observational study. Yeah. And those are unfortunately the easiest to manipulate. So the, the vegetarian, I have nothing against vegetarians. I was one myself for eight years and a vegan for two years. Uh, but like I said, I have something against scientists or people who claim to be scientists that uh, incorrectly use scientific data to, to prove their point. And right. the vegetarian agenda is very good at doing that. Mm -hmm. And they abuse observational studies unlike anyone I've ever seen. Yeah. So I get a lot of questions about the China study. Um, yes, which is which is a big observational study. Uh, T. Colin Campbell at Cornell was uh, was the head of that. And uh, again, it can't establish cause and effect. Mm -hmm. uh, that thing has been picked apart by many others in the community. So I yeah. feel it's kind of like a mood point for me to, to, to do that. But just the fact that it, it cannot establish cause and effect is, a, right. is, is something that you have to keep in mind. And also that there's a variety of confounding variables meaning that there's other things that have not been observed that could cause the effect, mm -hmm. that could explain the effect that you see uh, that are just not noted. Uh, one big one in the uh, in the China study is um, schistoma, schistosomiasis. Um, it's, a, it's an infection. It's related to colon cancer, and uh, that explains a lot of the uh, what you see between cholesterol levels and because when you get an infection, your cholesterol levels will increase. Mm -hmm. The... Uh, LDL particles are part of the immune system. Lipoproteins are part of the immune system. They, right. they just shuttle away dead components of the bacteria and stuff like that. And then that virus was associated with colon cancer. And it turns out that uh, increasing meat consumption does indeed increase cholesterol. But if you look at the direct correlation, not the confounding variables, the direct correlation between eating meat and cancer, it's not there. It's, yeah. There's nothing that's significant. So uh, you know right there that T. Colin Campbell was a fraud because in order to make his point, he had to insert a confounding variable. He had to insert cholesterol. So he can't correlate meat directly with cancer. He has to correlate meat with cholesterol and then cholesterol with cancer. Yeah. And cancer is a type of infection. So when you have that, your cholesterol is going to go up. It's uh, it's crooked all yeah. around. <laughs> but it's just so I was a vegetarian also for a period of time. I think a lot of people who like find their way to paleo uh, kind of dip their toes in it at some point. Uh, but paleo people aren't 100% correct either. In fact, far of course and, not. and you talk about that all the time. So what are some examples yeah. of how people go wrong, especially when they're first starting out? Uh, so I gave a talk about that at AHS 2011. I thought that people were going to throw some nightshades at me, uh, <laughs> but they didn't. Uh, Let's see. Let's let's try to simplify this. If someone were to say, "We evolved over this period, this period of time, whether it's millions of years, hundreds, of thousands of years, and we were eating mostly these foods," so we are most likely to be adapted to these foods. Fair statement. I have no problem with that, and I want people to understand that because there's people that don't understand that they think that I have a problem with that statement. That is a fair statement. Mm -hmm. The problem is the following. Every time that it rains, the sky is gray. 
is the following true? Every time the sky is gray, it rains. Right. It's it's not true. Yeah. Right. So that's a logical fallacy to assume that it would be true. So we evolved over millions of years eating these foods. We are best adapted to them. Fair statement. Mm -hmm. We evolved over millions of years never eating these foods, so we are not adapted to them. Incorrect right. statement. Yeah. Completely incorrect assumption. You cannot assume that because we never consumed a food, we are not adapted to it. And in fact, I had a meeting uh, recently with uh, like some Harvard students and Richard Wrangham, you know, who's a huge evolutionary and, uh, and diet uh, individual here at Harvard. I shouldn't call. I shouldn't say diet. It's more evolutionary, but he studies. Uh, diet within the concept, uh, the context of evolution. Sure. And I asked him the question. I said, "Richard, pick a point in time in evolution, any point you want, and imagine that at that point in time, none of the species on the planet can eat a food that they've never eaten before. What would happen?" And he's like, "They would all starve. I'm like that's correct. They would they'd starve and they would die. I mean, and and life would stop and evolution would stop in its tracks. That is correct. So to assume that you know you." cannot consume a substance because you never consumed it before is completely false. Yeah. In fact, that happened to our ancestors. So, you know, we went from things that, if you believe in evolution, went from things that looked like chimp that were eating mostly fruit, mm -hmm. came to the ground, started scavenging on carcasses, so eating bone marrow and brains, uh, then added some tubers to the mix, at some point figured out cooking, and then started hunting animals, eating meat, cooking the meat and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at it from that perspective, what's really inter uh, interesting too, what I found from my work for last year, is that the nutrient density increases yeah. along the way. Right. So as you go from fruit to tubers to meat and you start cooking, you extract more, um, both macronutrients and micronutrients from the food, the nutrient density increases. And if you look at what happened to our guts and our brains during that time, the guts got smaller because the, the burden on digestion was much smaller. And our brains got bigger, yeah, because we could extract more calories uh, and more nutrients from the foods that we were eating. So all that in my, in my mind is is completely compatible. But this statement of like we've never eaten something, so we're not adapted to it, is completely false. Another one that drives me absolutely nuts <laughs> is this. Uh, it's almost a religious in nature, and I have no problem with religion as long as you realize that it's faith based, whereas you know science is just it's data driven. Right. Uh, you you have to question in science, whereas you have to accept in, in religion. Sure. Uh, this thing there, you know, you pick a date 15,000 years ago, let's say, is the advent of agriculture. And everything that came after that, this, you, can't, you can't eat that. And again, it's this assumption that we, we couldn't have discovered a, a new, better source of food. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I have to agree that our track record has been darn poor. <laughs> but there are certain things like, say, dairy that, that aren't that bad, although some people are intolerant. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the arguments that we make are, you know, they're, they're pretty bad. And I've, I'm not surprised there's a new book that just came out. It made like a, a huge fuss. It's actually really bad, but I'm not surprised that someone's actually criticizing the paleo diet on it. I, saw that. Uh, I say it's really bad because I have thought about this quite a bit. I presented on the subject. I know, I know where the flaws are. Mm -hmm. And the author of this book made some statements that I, you know, again, I criticize everybody, but I, I was, I was completely taken aback. I'm like, really? You're an evolutionary biologist and you just made this argument. <laughs> Do you have an uh, example of that? Uh, yeah. So she, she argues that, well, she was at a conference with Cordain and she, she goes up to Cordain and she says, you know, the evolutionary changes can actually, can actually happen really quickly. And what she meant by that was or like adaptations. Right. And Cordain was like, huh? She's like, yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, so two examples that she brings up in the book, one, crickets. Like, okay, so crickets reproduce once every year, have a large litter, and have com and are subjected to completely different environmental pressures than we are. Yeah. We don't have to worry about getting stomped by a big human being or something that's way larger than we are and all, all these kinds of things. The predators, like we're top of the food chain. Yeah. Predators, whereas they're bottom of the food chain prey, you know, it's it's completely different. You can't, of course, they're going to evolve very quickly. Yeah. You can't make that comparison. That just <laughs> doesn't work. And then um, another one is the lactase persistency. Mm -hmm. And it, that's a that is a great example. The problem is that it's an exception. Yeah. And we're we still haven't uh, agreed upon what caused such a quick because it, it is unique in how fast it came about in human beings i'm not talking about 
other mammals that reproduce far faster than we do. I'm talking about human beings. It is fairly unique, and we're not sure exactly what the pressure was, why it came about so quickly. Uh, but if you look at the adaptation, it's a, it's a very simple adaptation in that all you had to do was turn off the mechanism and say, okay, we're just going to leave lactase on from now. So the, what we needed for that ad adaptation was already there. We yeah. had the ability to process lactase. We just had to, to lengthen it. Right. So that's a very like low-level adaptation. Not something that I would use to make the case that we can evolve very rapidly or that we have adapted to grain consumption. Yeah. Something else that there was uh, some statements that I read about on, on the web where she's been interviewed is that she makes the argument that we're designed to, to eat starch and that paleos are that the tubers are not paleo. Yeah. Well, the tubers are not paleo thing, that comes from using that stupid fifteen thousand year ago argument. Just yeah. stop using that, please. Okay. Yeah. That's I hope we can agree on that. <laughs> uh but the, the sweet potatoes, I think, did come about before that date. The potatoes did not. So yeah. which tuber you pick, it all depends on, on you. Starch, Chris Masterjohn did an excellent presentation at AHS 2012, making the argument that we are obviously designed to eat, to consume starch yeah. as human beings. Starch is not the problem. She's creating a, a, you know, a straw man with that argument. It's the proteins in the grains and legumes that are the problem. They are very immunogenic and very allergenic. There's more and more research being published on that every day. Uh, so, okay, starch. Yeah, sure, I agree with you. Actually, we're we're designed to to uh, to consume starch and to degrade starch. That's not the problem. It's the proteins, and we have the the level of proline oligopeptidases in the human gut. It's fairly low, mm -hmm. and we don't have really good tools to degrade prolamines, which are found in grains and to some extent in legumes. They actually have a slightly different name. They're globulins in legumes, but uh, no big deal. So I, was, I wasn't I was super impressed with the author, but I kind of agree with her in that you know, Cordain has made his share of mistakes too. If you look at his research, he is incredibly biased. He uh, he has done everything that I've just uh, said like a, a good scientist should not do. He searches the literature for things that support his claims and he publishes them. Uh, he, he is an incredibly biased researcher. Um, I'm not saying he hasn't done the public a favor by bringing this this lifestyle to light and um, making it uh, very popular, but I can totally see why the author is trying to criticize him because right. I, I've criticized him myself. It's just the, he's an incredibly biased researcher. Yeah. So along those lines of foods that we may be well adapted to or not well adapted to, is there a mm -hmm. hierarchy in your mind in some like gray area you mentioned dairy might fall into yeah. kind of the gray so for dairy you've got either lactose intolerance or casein intolerance that uh you know could be a problem and that's something that you're just going to have to figure out on your own yeah. sometimes it's going to be obvious it's going to be immediate sometimes it won't so it's up to you to decide how much of this stuff you include in your diet, mm -hmm. you know, to what extent. If you're lactose intolerant, maybe you can tolerate some aged cheeses. They have a lot less lactose. If you don't tolerate the aged cheeses, it's probably a casein intolerance. Um, but they, it is nutritious food at the end of the day, so I think it is worthwhile yeah. to include in the diet if you if you can. I'm not saying it should be the biggest proportion of calories, but sure. to have some of it in the diet, that's definitely a gray area. Um, I don't use the caveman argument to justify a grain and legume free diet. What I do uh, say is that I've already mentioned grains contain and legumes contain very immunogenic and allergenic properties. Sure. The agriculture of grains as currently practiced, which is key word here, as currently practiced. If you're going to criticize me for this statement, make sure that you note that I said as currently practiced <laughs> is unsustainable. Grains and legumes are uh, used to make a variety of highly palatable and rewarding junk foods. Mm -hmm. So if you cut those from your diet, you're cutting out a lot of junk food. Uh, but that then there's something to me to be said for people who like focus on paleo desserts. I'm like, you're missing the point. Mm -hmm. Really, you're missing the point. Um, and then nutrient density, as I talked about in my AHS 2012 talk, it turns out that uh, grains and legumes are fairly nutrient poor. Uh, I'm going to give an, an updated version of that talk because I uh, oh cool I stress test the data after the talk, and it turns out that. I, uh, standardization was not the best technique to use because there was too much variation in the data. So really? instead of using a standardization, I just divided all the nutrients by their RDA, mm -hmm. which brings everything within the same order of magnitude and makes them unitless so I can use the same uh, the same definition again. 
Uh, so I think using those four criteria, you can make a very, very good case against wheat. Now, if someone says, well, I'm going to pick the grain that has the highest nutrient density, like quinoa, yeah. and has the less documented uh, negative health effects, then can I have some of that? I'm like, you can have some of it if you, you know, you don't have any reactions to it, but don't make that 70% of your calories. Yeah. Uh, the same with legumes. Again, you know, they, they appear, uh, if you've watched my HS 2012 talk, there's someone that, yeah, um, that I dismissed immediately. Uh, the first person that asked the question, I dismissed immediately uh, for a couple of reasons. One, that person made a statement, uh, seemed to me like he was very biased, probably coming from the Weston A. Price Foundation. There, I just bashed someone else. Um, actually, the Weston A. Price Foundation is not all that bad, but you know they have their biases too. Uh, legumes being one of them, yeah. properly prepared legumes. Uh, the person said that I did not treat legumes fairly. Actually, he's completely wrong, and it's the opposite. It's the opposite because my model does not take into account bioavailability. Mm -hmm. And if you look at legumes, if you look at grains, they contain a variety of compounds. They have phytates, they have oxalic acids, they have tannins, the polyphenols, all that stuff. They bind to a variety of minerals and prevent you from absorbing them. Yeah. In my model, I'm assuming that you're absorbing everything that's there, which is never the case. No matter what you eat, that is never the case. So I'm actually treating them more favorably, mm -hmm. not less favorably. But if you look at them using the four criteria that I just gave you, the legumes uh, are slightly more nutrient dense, uh, and their agriculture might be sustainable. You know, I, I'm not an expert on that, and uh, I think I mean they're certainly oftentimes used to add nitrogen to the soil, so there's a bit more of a benefit. But then it all depends on how you do the agriculture. Of course, mm -hmm. it's, that's not the only thing that will help the soil. If you still rip everything off at the end and don't leave any cover, then you're still destroying the soil. Right. Um, so where does yeah. that where does that leave Matt? Like, what are you eating day to day? And are you do you have too much information that you're like a little? No, bit no, not at okay. all. Okay. Um, so I have protein at every meal. Mm -hmm. You know, breakfast is going to be either you know, some eggs uh, or a little bit of sausage, some bacon, something something like that. Uh, pretty quick in the morning. I have a very small breakfast during the week. It's typically just four hard, hard boiled eggs, and then mm -hmm. I'm done. Uh, lunch is going to be some piece of meat on some greens, vegetables any kind of greens. Everything is cooked, by the way, the, the raw food diet, it's, I don't recommend. Oh, really? Everything? Uh, yeah, everything is cooked. I wow. cook absolutely everything. Just because you extract, you do lose a little bit of nutrients, but you extract more. Yeah. So it's, you know, it, and if you look at the studies of the people that are on those raw food diets, they, um, uh, the women lose their period, uh, the cholesterol levels go in the wrong direction, so do triglycerides. It's uh, it's actually not a healthy lifestyle. You can't, you just can't. I talked about this with Richard Rangham, actually, uh, because he's all about the cooked food. And you just cannot extract enough cal calories and micronutrients from the, from that diet to be healthy. What about uh, so I could, in, I, in combination of like some raw foods, some cooked I'm fine foods. with that. Okay. Yeah, I'm cool. fine with that. So sorry, I interrupted you, but uh, oh, no <laughs> so you're at lunch. Yeah, so I'm at lunch, and then I'll have like some kind of tuber, I prefer tubers over fruit for carbohydrate, uh, and I do eat carbohydrate. Probably 50% of my calories come from carbohydrate. Wow. I'd say like 30% from protein, and then uh, the 20% from fat. And the fat is none, no fat that's added. It's just whatever's in the meat. Okay. Um, so I'll have like some greens, some tubers, and then a piece of meat on top of that. And then for dinner, I'll probably have like another uh, steak and, and tuber kind of deal, like meat and tuber kind of deal. That's cool. essentially how I eat. So I stick to to what you know. I follow my own prescription, yeah. and I stick to to what is uh, most nutrient dense, which is meat, vegetables, and tubers. Yeah. So th that sounds, especially compared to like the primal community, that sounds fairly mm -hmm. low in fat. Is there? What's the thinking behind that? So I have no bias with regards to high fat and low fat. Mm -hmm. No bias. To me, what should determine whether you should be high fat or low fat or, or whatever the macronutrient ratio you want to pick are one, genetics and epigenetics. Mm -hmm. There's some people that don't tolerate carbohydrates or fats or other things because of the of levels of enzymes that you know they have. Sure. That's a fact. The other one is the sport. Are you athletic? Right. And if so, what kind of sport? Is it just powerlifting or is it endurance sports? You know, mm -hmm. the, the amount of carbohydrate you have to eat for that is gonna vary quite a bit. And uh, within that, you might have some mismatches. You might have someone that doesn't tolerate carbohydrate very well that wants to be an endurance runner. Well, that, that's gonna to be tough. I, sucks, I, I, yeah. I don't have, yeah, I, I 
don't have any good advice for you. Yeah. Uh, but to me, those are the things that should determine, you know, whether you're high fat, low fat, whatnot, what you tolerate, what makes you feel good, yeah. what makes you look the best naked, right. that kind of stuff. Um, you, the low fat, though, you know, the, since we mentioned it, that is a pet peeve of mine. Mm -hmm. You know, I will admit that it is very useful, especially for people who are overweight because they often have hyperglycemia and insulin resistance and whatnot. Uh, but the people who are for the diet are a, a little bit, I call them zealots. Yeah. They're a little bit too enthusiastic about it. It's like low carb for everyone, even athletes. And I have seen that ruin people, completely ruin people. There's some very good research out there that shows that if you try to do very glycogen demanding sports on a low carb diet, your cortisol levels are going to keep increasing and then your free testosterone levels are going to plummet. Mm. And the free testosterone uh, level to cortisol level is used as a marker of overtraining. Yeah. And immediately those people are like, all right, you're overtrained. Yeah. There are some people that have come to us who have been engaging in some really high glycogen demanding sport. They've been doing a low carb diet and they have had testosterone levels of prepubescent teenage girls, wow. men, wow. men with testosterone levels of prepubescent teenage girls. They, I feel horrible. I'm like, no kidding. Yeah. I, I would feel horrible too if I were you. I mean, it, it's and getting digging yourself out of that hole yeah. takes a really long time. So it's a tool. And I do realize that it's useful. But for yeah. some people, it's really not okay. Even folks who are not athletic, but leave a very active, stressful life. Mm -hmm. That could be the end of them. You know, the, the yeah. cortisol increase that has to occur in order to ramp up gluconeogenesis could actually be the could actually be harmful. So, you know, again, it's it's not that I'm against it. I just it's a tool. You have to know when to use it. Yeah. Don't don't be so closed minded. Right. And it's interesting to see how different people, different bodies react to completely yeah. different training schemes and like. Uh, I'm training one of my friends who's a bodybuilder right now and he's preparing for a competition and he's kind of mm -hmm. done it both ways. He's done it the, the heavily restricted eating chicken breast with no fat and sweet potato three times a day type thing and just munching on raw veggies for the rest of the day. He's done it that way. Got to a really low body fat. I think it was like 4%. Right now he's doing cyclical ketogenic just to see how his mm -hmm. body responds to it. And he's um, <laughs> in both instances, he's been completely wrecked. Once he gets below... You sure. know, like 6% oh, yeah. body fat. He's just wrecked anyway. But it seems like keto is working pretty well for him, but it doesn't for everyone. So it's it's really uh, it, it's really important for those people out there who are listening to, like Matt is saying, become your own guru. Yep. Because like dogmatism doesn't really work well for anyone, it, as it turns out. Um, the keto stuff works really well for getting bodybuilders into, uh, you know, low body fat numbers. Yeah. But like you said, they're wrecked afterwards. Yeah. There's a price to pay for that. Uh, if you look at any sport and you're looking like at elite performance, there is a health cost to it. Mm -hmm. um, there is always a health cost to it. So, I mean, I, I agree that the, the healthier you get, probably the longer you're going to live and the better your performance is going to be. But at some point, if you're chasing like really, really elite performance, yeah. your health is going to take a back seat. And that there's just, and, and I bodybuilding, yeah, I consider that a sport. Yeah. Uh, and your health is going to take a back seat if you're looking for really elite, you know, low body fat numbers and all that stuff. Right. Or even getting ready for fitness competitions. One of my friends um, did one, I think it was a couple of years back. And he said, I think he was down to like 5% body fat, something like that. And <laughs> that weekend, within like three days, he put on 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. It's just like he just had a rice cake binge. I'm like, why are you eating rice cakes? <laughs> of all things, right? <laughs> of all things. Of all things. But yeah, that's, I mean, that isn't something that's to be encouraged especially yeah. with this a lot of that was probably water though from the glycogen right. that was being repleted yeah so when glycogen is stored in muscles it, it takes a lot of water with it <laughs> but yeah. but rice cakes I mean, come on i think he said he ate eight packages of chocolate rice cakes i'm gonna have him on the show soon he'll, okay. he'll remain nameless until he's on but i thought that that was fascinating and just like <laughs> you're kind of following what your body really wants and needs at that point sure right you know like that's sure. exactly what your body is screaming for so in some ways actually maybe that's the best thing that you can do is respond to that in a way just a lot of yeah a lot yeah. of cheap carbohydrate but i would have preferred like potatoes or sweet potatoes oh, yeah. at least at least that it comes for nutrients right because as soon as i give that nutrient density talk there's a lot of people, you know, I can talk about that in a little bit more detail, but I picked essential nutrients. Yeah. A lot of people are like, well, well why, why are they essential? And it's, 
the answer might seem obvious to you and me, but they're not looking for the obvious answer. Mm -hmm. They're not looking for, well, the body can't synthesize them in large enough quantities, so we have to get them from the diet. What they mean is, what are they doing? I I want to know, what are they doing in the body? And one of the examples I'll often use is that I'll show them glycolysis, and I'll say, listen, when your body burns sugar and sends this acetyl-CoA into the Krebs cycle, pyruvate to acetyl-CoA into the Krebs cycle, to make FADH2 and NADH, which then goes through oxidative phosphorylation to make ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. Here are all the vitamins and the enzymes that are being used. And here's the lifetime of those enzymes. You know, the longest enzymes will probably live like five days or something like that. Then they have to be completely, they're ubiquitin tagged, sent to the proteasome, completely degraded, and rebuilt back up. Mm-hmm. And then the, the vitamins, they can be recycled too. They're cofactors for those a lot of those enzymes. But at some point, you're going to need new vitamins. You can only recycle them so many times before they break down. Kind of like a car, you know, things are spinning. They can only spin for so many times before sure. things start breaking down. Uh, and, and I tell them, if this breaks down, you can't process your calories anymore, right? Or if you're consuming a lot of empty calories that have no nutrients, what's going to happen? Vitamin deficiencies. Yeah. Right? Is it any surprise that we see vitamin and mineral deficiencies everywhere uh, in this country in North America, well, no, because we're eating a lot of empty calories. Right. So when I see people just, you know, doing some big carb repletion, like this, this is not a green light to eat whatever you want. It should, it should still have some nutrient density in it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really interesting. Now, if we can, I'd love to shift gears a little bit and get your take on something. I've been talking a lot about um, the the state of science and how everyone, like I said before, kind of assumes that it knows everything, but as a scientist yourself, as a researcher mm-hmm. and, and someone who is, you know, uh, knuckle deep in the data a lot, how do you account for the things that science doesn't currently understand or that has yet to be discovered? Oh, and that you can't account for that. And what I thought you were going to ask is, because you, you seem to be indicating that we always get things right. And that's certainly not the case. You yeah. know, the process of science is just, is to investigate, look at the data, you know, reach some conclusions based on the data, and then someone else will, or maybe even yourself, will just keep investigating and adding on top of that until at some point you may realize, like, oh my God, we were completely wrong, yeah. and we have to like take a shift, and 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 that happens all the time. So mm-hmm. some people get frustrated in the realm of nutrition because, like I said, it's a little bit more like politics, and backpedaling in politics is very unpopular. Yeah. But in in um, science, it happens all the time. It's like, hey, you know what? Listen, we were wrong. We have to start again. <laughs> and that happens to be interesting. Like yeah. when, when that happens, it's interesting. It's like, oh, cool. There's more to study here. There's something else going on. It's more complicated than we thought. Right. Whereas in, in like in nutrition and politics, it's, it's the end of the world. Yeah. Can't do that. Now, how do you account for things that you don't know? You can't. You can research. You can, well, we don't know this. Let's try to study it a little bit more. But when I give a talk and I don't know the answer, I don't try to make something up. It's like, listen. <laughs> yeah. This is cutting edge right now. Like what I presented is this is what we know at the moment, and I can't go any further. And, yeah. and even what I present to you right now, it, it could be wrong. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. just my best interpretation of what of the data that we have. And that's so nice to hear because it's it's very rare that people, especially <laughs> in, it, in your position, will say something like that. Sure. I mean, I'm a scientist you know, yeah. at heart i am just looking for the right answers i don't care if i'm right or wrong yeah it doesn't matter to me that's very i cool. mean i i hope that i you know i'm helping people i'm seeing things that are mostly right uh, but in in the details when it gets to mechanisms and stuff like that there are things that are going to change yeah for sure yeah that's so, how it's got to be so what are some things that uh that you could see shifting in the next five to ten years that might be cutting edge right now but will become more accepted uh, our understanding of what causes autoimmunity, that, that you know, I mean, we've got these prolamine proteins, specifically gliadin in wheat, that increases intestinal permeability, but that is not the only thing that is required to trigger some kind of autoimmune reaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, infections can do that too, and exactly what the interplay, it, it, you know, it, then, then you've got the gut microbiota yeah. and the interplay between all of those things and which one is king, do you require all of them, that kind of stuff. I mean, there is some really, really cool research coming out with respect to, uh, to the gut microbiota right now. I was recently at a talk here at Harvard by Rob Knight. Uh, I would look up his research. He's got all kinds of interesting research with respect to 
to uh, gut bacteria and, and microbiota in, in general. And there's some really interesting stuff that's going to come out. There's already a, a company, I'm not going to name the company because um, it's something that he he said after his talk, it's not in his talk, and he consults for the company, so it's information that he was privy to, and I'm not going to throw him under the bus. Sure. But he said that there's a pharmaceutical company that studied the type of bacteria that is an overgrowth in a rat's gut when they're fed a ton of junk food and they're obese, found a um, narrow spectrum antibiotic, meaning that it's mostly targeting that one organism, mm -hmm. fed that narrow spectrum antibiotic to the rat and cured it of obesity just because it changed the rat's wow. microbiome in the gut. Yeah. Holy smokes. So that, that brings like a completely new light on the term obesity epidemic, mm -hmm. right? Because this has never been considered an epidemic. And I still don't because transferring microbiota from one gut to another is not something that can be done unless there's some kind of fecal transplant or something like that, right? You, you, you can't just sneeze on someone and make them obese. That's not going to happen. Uh, but it's it still has to do with infectious organisms, yeah. which, is, which is very interesting. Uh, and our understanding of that is uh, is just beginning to you know to get to a place where we can start a asking some very interesting questions. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's some of the stuff that's uh, that's going to change a lot. That's cool. So it's almost like being obese, or you, you give that pathogen access, which results in all the metabolic disorders and obesity and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I mean, some of the things that these um, gut bacteria can do for one. Many of them that are an overgrowth are gram-negative bacteria. They contain something in their membranes called lipopolysaccharide. Uh, it's uh, an endotoxin, which means it's toxic to the liver. It's hepatotoxic, uh, so it can cause some liver problems. The liver is responsible for a lot of things in the body, so having some liver problems is not good. When that stuff gets into the bloodstream, it actually increases the number of uh, LDL and HDL particles, mostly LDL, uh, because the, the, the system is on the defense. Mm -hmm. So if you see someone with high cholesterol it, it might not be that you know it's uh it's a uh, heading toward atherosclerosis or it's a sign that the person's going to die of a heart attack it could be a, in, you know the start of an infection or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or there's something like that so yeah. we have to be a lot more sophisticated with the questions that we ask given the data that we have now when we look at people uh, those gram negative bacteria interestingly enough there are uh, saccharides in, in wheat and grains that favor their growth so that they can ferment and favor their growth. Yeah. So maybe maybe it, it's not the, the protein. Maybe the, the, the protein gliadin in wheat is just for people who are specifically allergic to it. They're either intolerant or they have auto, uh, like a gluten sensitivity of some kind. Um, and, and maybe it's all about the, the intestinal overgrowth of a certain bacteria. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's all of the above. You know, it's, it's interesting. Those bacteria, when they're in overgrowth, uh, they can also force you to extract more calories from your food hmm. uh, you know you see that it's this is complex yeah. there's just a lot of stuff going on right here but it's it's very interesting yeah your work's cut out for you yeah <laughs> well that's so cool well, we're just in, oh, go ahead well right now i'm not uh, studying in that field yeah. right so I'm, I'm still just an employee uh, at harvard uh, i read the literature and i, and I try to uh, to understand it and like i said bring a very much the, the rigors of, of the core science to it. Uh, now, when it comes to things like gut bacteria and whatnot, I think that research is, uh, it's, I would consider that outside of the realm of nutrition, it's being done very well. Yeah. Uh, but the other things that are coming out of, let's say, like the public health sector, I'm, I'm not quite so psyched about. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're just about out of time, but I'd love just to open the floor to you to okay. rant about something that, okay. that is ticking you off right now that, that maybe hasn't come out yet, like on stage or whatever. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I'm looking back at my slides right now because I have to give that nutrition talk at, yeah. uh, at Paleo FX. And the term nutrient density, from a scientific perspective, to me, all that should be is nutrients divided by volume. Mm -hmm. By de definition, scientifically, a density is divided by volume. It's per volume. There's three problems I can think of with that definition, however. One, which nutrients? Yeah. You, we have to agree on something. Right. Which nutrients? Now, if you're looking at one part, particular nu nutrient, that, that's fine. That's you, the nutrient density of this is, that's fine. But if you're looking at a, like a score, you want to rank something, then we have to agree on the nutrients. Right. Two, 
Nutrients are present in very different quantities in the body. Some nutrients like calcium are always going to be present in like thousands of milligrams. Others are always going to be present in like one to two milligrams. Right. If you add up the nutrients, then there's an overemphasis on calcium, and it's not fair. Some nutrients might be present in milligram quantities, others in microgram quantities. You could convert the micrograms to milligrams, but then again, you have the same problem I just noted. You know, the emphasis of the micrograms on the score is, is almost irrelevant. Yep. Um, or uh, your other option is that you can't add them up. Mm -hmm. You have to find some way to, to deal with that. And then three is the volume. Yeah. Something like bread has a ton of volume that's air. Mm -hmm. You you can't. You know, it's pretty difficult to use volume unless you powder or you know put everything in a blender or liquefy everything. Sure. To make it, you know, and then I can imagine some problems arising from that. If you've yeah. got some air uh, sensitive polyunsaturated fatty acids, they'll oxidize. You know, you're, you're changing the food, uh, but we do, you know, in our mouths, mash the food to a certain extent, and and uh, we do do that. So the volume can be taken care of pretty easily. You just use mass instead, mm -hmm. you know, and the the mass of air doesn't count, obviously. So the bread is not a problem. The nutrients you then you then have to agree on something. And to me, from a scientific perspective, again, unbiased, the obvious thing is essential nutrients. Mm -hmm. Because they're essential, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, why am I looking at like polyphenols and beta carotenes? And well, maybe if you're a vegetarian bias, you want to make vegetables look really good, you can do that. <laughs> and that's what certain people have done. Uh -huh. uh, they've even gone as far as, you know, taking out vitamin B12. Um, and, you know, it's just the people who are because there is no accepted definition and because of, th of those problems I've just noted, people have gotten really liberal sure. with how they calculate scores and they're now putting saturated fat in the denominator and all that stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 that, that, that does not belong there. Yeah. That absolutely does not belong there. Um, so, you know, like I said, in order to, uh, to address that and to, uh, to eliminate all those biases, uh, I changed that definition and it's now the sum of essential nutrients divided by the mass but for the essential nutrients, each one is divided by its RDA. Mm -hmm. That does the job of eliminating the units, so the milligrams and micrograms, so you can add up everything. And it also brings everything within similar orders of magnitude, so you're not putting too much emphasis on one yeah. versus another um, because the standardization doesn't work. And then I'll present that uh, that new work, uh, that that revised work, if you will, at, uh, at Paleo FX. Um, there have been some few changes within the rankings, like within food categories, but the but the food categories themselves, they're still where where they were at earlier. Oh, um, really? So the, yeah, yeah, and cool. and in fact, greens and legumes look even worse. Oh no! Um, even though I haven't taken uh, bioavailability into account. Yeah. So it's uh, this whole nutrient density thing is really really aggravating me right now. It is clear that the vegetarian agenda has taken a hold of it it's running with it it's incredibly biased especially if you look at joel Ferelman's andy system i mean i could not come up with a more biased system than that <laughs> uh, it's fairly obvious from, from how they calculated it so we we need to have this discussion yeah we really do this uh, i'm going to try to to see if i can publish something uh, in a nutrition journal uh, my guess is it's going to be difficult because again a lot of nutrition journals have like top vegetarian folks at right. the editorial board mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, this has to be defined. This has right. to be fixed because right now it's being used and abused more often than a midget in a Nine Inch Nails concert. <laughs> it's just, it, it's got to stop. Well, you can always publish it on my blog. <laughs> <laughs> if everything else fails, that's we'll, right. We'll get it out there. Well, I'm looking forward to your talk. Um, we have to go, but um, before we do, why don't you just tell folks what you're working on now and, and where they can find you? Uh, well, you know, like I said, I'm not very active in the. Um, in the social media, it's always felt like homework to me, and I'm pretty good at giving myself homework. Like I have a lot of homework to do. Sure. I have a full-time job, and I do this as a hobby. Mm -hmm. uh, I am working on right now fixing my paleo talk, my talk for um, nutrient density talk for paleo effects. Uh, I'm working on uh, writing the paper so I can get that published. Uh, Aaron, Aaron Blosdell from AHS uh, wants to put together like a big book where you know various personalities from from the um, the community are contributing chapters, and I will contribute a nutrient density chapter to that, and that's probably Very what cool. I'm I'm going to try to publish. Uh, so those are the things that I'm working on. If you do want to uh, to find some of my work online, I do give lectures for optimum performance training. Uh, I do the the 
a nutrition part of their lecture. The other part is done by James Fitzgerald himself and Mike Kessley. They go into the implementation. So it's a two-part series where I'm like, here's all the science, but mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately it's coaches. A lot of this stuff goes over their heads. And I realize that because I'm, I'm actually, my talk is more appropriate for like a, a medical community than sure. it is for the coach community. And that's, that's my failing. I'm just not very good at adapting it to a different community because I'm at the academic level. Um, but uh, you then get the application implementation part by James and Mike, which is which is really good and much better than just like here's what you should eat. Yeah. So uh, that's why I've teamed up with them and uh, cool putting that together. In the very near future, Rob and I are working on like the high end part of my talk. So taking the stuff that's like really um, really medical medical scientific and making that into a uh, medical accredited course. Very so a continuing cool. medical CME course, continuing medical education course, and, and that'll be online. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, when when would that come out? Within the year. Really? Yeah. Good for you guys. That is so cool and much needed right now. Absolutely. I, th I think so. Yeah. yeah. That's going to do great. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for coming on that. I'm looking forward to your talk, and we'll see you uh, in just a few days. All right. Thank you. Rock on. Thanks, man. Hey, this is Abel, and I have a quick question for you. Do you want to get in the best shape of your life without giving up your favorite foods? Don't miss your opportunity to get the new Fat Burning Chef e-cookbook featuring more than 200 delicious recipes from the top paleo chefs in the world. You can get it now for a huge discount at fatburningchef.com. You can type it in from any device. Keep on listening for the details. Meet Jane. Jane knows she's supposed to eat right, but it's been one heck of a long day and she's short on time to cook a healthy, delicious dinner. Jane knows she can get lean by choking down reheated chicken breast and steamed broccoli six times a day for the next three months, but that doesn't sound like very much fun. Fortunately, Jane's in luck because her friend just sent her a collection of over 150 quick and easy recipes that just so happen to keep the pounds off. It's called the Fat Burning Chef. And through the magic of the interwebs, this handy, interactive, digital cookbook beams straight to you instantly. And since it lives on your iPhone, iPad, Droid, computer, or other gizmo, you'll never be without quick and easy fat-burning meals. But it's not just about mouth-watering recipes. We want to change the world with real food. When you grab the Fat-Burning Chef, you get another copy as a free gift to share with your friends and family. So if you're short on time and want to know what's for dinner tonight, head on over to fatburningchef.com and we'll fix you right up. Bon appetit, Jane. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fat Burning Man. If you liked it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the podcast app, or wherever else you might be listening to or watching this show. Got a second? Please leave me a quick review on iTunes. I always love hearing from you. And if you think someone else might like and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or with a family member. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at FatBurnMan and Facebook by typing in Abel James or FatBurningMan. Drop me a line anytime. Did you know that I've recorded over 150 episodes of Fat Burning Man, winning four awards in independent media and hitting number one in more than eight countries? And here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode for free. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. I'll give you a second to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes in video and audio versions for all the past episodes of Fat Burning Man. Better yet, enter your best email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide to start burning fat right now and a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free fat burning downloads straight to your inbox and make sure that you never miss a show again. This is Abel James signing off. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week. I love nutrition, I love nutrition stuff, and I love health. 
but Able Eye's never seen anything even come close to the power of removing this incredible poison from our diet. Yeah, I know personally when I.